Welcome back. Welcome back. Sorry. <laughs> Welcome back for the second and the last session of this morning. Um, I can uh, announce you that we are very pleased that uh, at this really moment we are uh, live on the website of the Belgian National Television, as you can see here uh, behind me. So uh, the world is watching. Um, and for those who are and and for those who uh, um, wonder um, or those who thought that they were going to see Chris French here and who know him um, and they see somebody else here, this is not a conjuring trick, this is really somebody else, right? <laughs> um, Chris uh, couldn't come, unfortunately, uh, because of health problems and if you all concentrate and we send him our concentrated best wishes, then probably he gets better <laughs> soon. Um, still, uh, it's a pity that he couldn't be here because he's one of the founding fathers of what the discipline which we call now the um, animalistic psychology. Um, but we have a very good stand-in, I think. Um, also from England, uh, Michael Heap, and he's a retired clinical and forensic psychologist, and he's very good at being skeptical at the pub, especially in Sheffield. But he's going to do these things here too and explain us a little bit more about what he thinks uh, animalistic psychology could be all about. We've just had an email from Chris French and everything's okay. So that's <laughs> Except uh, he can't get here in, 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 the, in the time available to him. So you, you have me. Um, every year in Sheffield and elsewhere in the UK, in March, we have something called Science Week. And in Sheffield, we have two universities, the University of Sheffield and the uh, Sheffield Hallam University. And during that week, they encourage lecturers to go out and into schools and teach children about their specialty in science. And I'm an honorary lecturer now, I don't, I don't work there now. And for about the best part of 20 years, I did this, um, until two years ago. And the title of my presentations was Science and the Paranormal. And the idea of the presentations to the children was um, to ask the question, what is special about science? What is, what is science about? What is the scientific method? Let's see if this works now. Yes. So it's, what do we mean when we say something is scientific or unscientific? Because there are many wonderful things that science tells us are true, or very likely to be true, and there are many wonderful things that scientists tell us are not true and unlikely to be true. And we call those things paranormal or supernatural, things like you can read people's minds or you can make things move just by thinking about them and so on, or you can contact people who have died and so on. Um, the, uh, the children I uh, see um, are different age ranges, but I find that the, uh, the ones from 11, 12, 13 are the best. They're the most enthusiastic. They're always willing to volunteer. Something happens at 15 and 16. <laughs> you know, any volunteers? And then the, uh, the older ones, the 16 to 18, um, I, I, I find are, are fine, and particularly if they're studying psychology. I also give these presentations to adults groups. I have an adult um, version of uh, my presentation to local clubs uh, and so on. So what's so special about science? I usually start with a demonstration. I do a few demonstrations of paranormal phenomena. And uh, a teacher once told me, start with a demonstration. That's a good, good way to start. But I'm not going to do that uh, I'm <laughs> today. I'm going to start with what I tell the children. This is the boring bit, so you must concentrate. And let's get it over with. 
Um, I start off by saying, imagine what it was like when um, the earliest human beings on the earth first looked, looked up to the sky on a clear night and what they would see. They would see something like this, all these hundreds and hundreds of points of light. And they would look in wonderment. And that is the first stage of science, to look, to observe, to be interested. If, you're not, if, if, if nobody wants to do that, then there's, science will never get done. And they'd notice all these points of light and they'd call them stars. And they'd notice that some of those stars were very faint and some were very bright. And they'd want to know why. They'd want an explanation. And that's the second phase of science, second stage, to want to know, to want to explain. What kinds of things would they uh, would they come up with? What kind of explanations? This is what I would ask the children. So I want you to imagine now that you are 11, 12, 13 year old children. Well behaved children. <laughs> so, I'm looking at uh, you, these people down here. <laughs> Uh, so, the kind of things they come up with are obvious things like, well, the, uh, the, the bright stars are nearer, aren't they? And the faint ones are further away. And the, uh, it was fine, yes, excellent. And then another thing might be, um, well, the faint stars are smaller and the bright stars are bigger. Good, excellent. You're being just like scientists now because you're explaining the world as you see it from what you already know, from what is already consistent with your knowledge. You know that things that are faint are often very far away, and also small things tend to be a bit faint, a bit dim as well as uh, in, uh, and compared with um, big things. Um, after, when they'd, made, when they'd uh, thought about these explanations, they wouldn't just stop, of course, they would continue to look. They would continue to uh, uh, find out uh, the, what, what um, the explanations could be. And another thing that they would notice is that um, as they were watching the heavens, the, the stars would be moving. They'd be moving. And then they would want to know why. What's going on here? And again, they would come up, well, again, I asked the children, and the children often come up with two possibilities. One is that the earth is standing still and the stars are ro rotating round. And, or, the earth is rotating and the stars are still. And again, this is based on their own knowledge, existing knowledge and understanding of the world. After all, well, if things are moving round you, you see them moving round, or if you, the world, oh, you're still there, I thought you would have gone by now. Um, <laughs> uh, you, would, you, would, um, you would see things moving round you. So, again, they would continue looking and continue observing to see which one of those explanations was right. And to begin with, they came up with um, the idea that the Earth was in the center of uh, all things. And the stars here, this is Ptolemy's um, version, the stars um, are all the same appear to be all the same distance from the Earth. I would also mention to them that some of the stars these points of light were moving in a rather um, unpredictable fashion and they called them wandering stars or planets and again they would ask the question what's going on here what what explanation do we have for that so we here have the um, how to think like the scientific method for this is for children remember not for uh, you know you intelligent grown-up people uh, first of all we observe and record what we observe, share what we observe with others. 
we ask the question how and why and so on. We try to explain things, what we observe, from what we already know best about the world. What, what fits with our, what is consistent with our existing understanding of the world. Go for the most likely explanations first. We keep observing and uh, later, we, of course, we do experiments to test our explanation to see if it works. And if it didn't work, then we try the next best explanation. Only go for weird explanations when no other explanation will do. So this is, this is as much as one can say, I think, to, to children to be, uh, uh, that they can take in. So now I go on to talk about what m people, what human beings have observed and how they've explained things in the universe since those early days. Okay, the earth is round and spins on its axis. Do scientists believe that? Yeah. Uh, and th I might, in, you know, interpose little questions to keep the children on the feet, like, how long does it take to, uh, for the Earth to rotate? 24 hours, of course. And so on. The Earth and the planets revolve around the Sun. Do science believe, scientists believe that? Yes, they know that. And then, what's that planet called with the rings around it? I can't... Saturn, thank you, Saturn, yes, yes. <laughs> See? Keep them, keep them thinking. <laughs> Our sun is a star, yes? Do scientists believe that? Yeah. Our sun is one of billions of stars in a galaxy called... The Milky Way, well done. I explained that this is a, not a photograph, of course. It's a, it's a <laughs> Sorry to disappoint you. Um, there are billions of other galaxies in the universe. Do scientists believe that? Yes. So. How about this one? Our universe began over three, 13 and a half billion years ago from an explosion. It's been getting bigger ever since. And I asked the children this and say, yeah. And what's it called? What do we call that theory? The Big Bang. They know, they know about the Big Bang, these children. The Big Bang Theory. <laughs> and then all life on Earth, including human life, has developed over billions of years from tiny creatures. Do scientists believe that? Yes. And uh, what do we call that? What do we call that? I don't use the word theory. It's not a theory now, is it? Real, I said. Same with the Big Bang. I say to the children, there's so much evidence now for that, for the idea that the, Earth, that the, the universe started from a very tiny point, that, that scientists are now certain that that's how, how it started. In some way, that's how it started. And the same with evolution. This is, the children know about evolution. And I say now, scientists now think that that's, there, there's so much evidence for evolution now that scientists you know, are certain about and which scientists do we associate with evolution? Um, <laughs> Would you take that man's name, please? <laughs> See you afterwards. Son. Charles Darwin, they all heard of Charles Darwin. So what science tells us is based on millions of observation over hundreds of years using this scientific method. And that's what's so special about science. Right, now here's a, your test, now the real test. Which of these extraordinary claims do scientists believe are true? It's possible to read people's mind by telepathy. Do scientists believe that's true? And they all say, no, no, no. You may believe it's true, but scientists uh, don't see any reason to believe that that is true. And at this point, I, I usually do a mind-reading trick. 
And the idea of the demonstration, the trick, I'm not going to do it now, I might do it afterwards for you if you like one of them, is to challenge the children and to say, remember the scientific method. Is there a simpler explanation for what you've just seen? Can you think of one that fits in with the, the way scientists now understand the world? Or do you believe that I can really read your minds? You see? And then how do you test that? If you've got an explanation, how do you test that explanation? We'll see that later. We are all made of stardust. Do scientists really believe we... Do scientists believe we're made of stardust? Yes. yes. The children say, no, no, no. <laughs> it's the way I say it, really. I say, do scientists believe that? And they think, oh, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> oh, they do, yes, yes. And then I explain this wonderful phenomenon of how um, our bodies and everything around us that we see in the room are... But, uh, from dust of stars that burnt out billions of years ago. And they, you can see some of them looking at themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the person next to you. They came from a star. You know the musical Hair? Isn't there a song in there about we are stardust or something? Anyway, forget it. Right, this is a, a plesiosaur. I think you can anticipate where we're going with this one. Um, Children love dinosaurs, don't they? This is a dinosaur, and they, I ask them about where dinosaurs are now, and they know that they're... Oh, you're shaking his head, is Tim. Oh. Uh, um, they, know, they know that dinosaurs died out millions and millions of years ago. Right, what's this? <laughs> there is a prehistoric monster in Loch Ness. The children know this about Nessie. And do scientists believe that? No, they say. Okay, so what could be a simpler explanation for what you see here? And they're very good. They come up with, you know, an otter, maybe a big fish, a, a log, a seal. Yeah, thank you. A seal. Very good, very good boy. Well done. <laughs> we got, we got a few. A scientist. Oh, the water now. I got so excited, I got so excited, I've knocked my water over now. <laughs> got a budding scientist here. Um, okay, and uh, then this is, uh, I show them this, and they uh, 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 say, what could this be? Is it a, could it be a dinosaur, a prehistoric monster? And they come up, what could it be instead? And they, you know, they, they say it's a fake, which we know that it is, I think, by now. And... Uh, or another one, one, one a couple of times they've said it's an elephant. <laughs> now, you laugh, you laugh, but wait a minute. Is it more likely to be an elephant than a dinosaur? Yes, yes of course. There could have been a circus come to Loch Ness and the owner said, just take the elephants for a swim, they're getting very hot, you see. <laughs> oh, why not? Um... So, if there is at least, this illustrates, if there's at least one possible normal explanation, science will not accept the paranormal or unusual explanation. Because, um, so for example, if uh, we showed, um, your friend showed you this photograph, and you said to him, is there any possibility that that's a fake? And he or she said, no, I know the chap who took this photograph, and he's, he's dead honest. He, he, he's as honest as the day is born. He would never lie. Sorry, sorry. He's, he's, he was a doctor, you know. He was a surgeon. He, he, yeah. <laughs> Not convinced? No, no. So long as there's another explanation then uh, a simpler explanation, then I'm not interested. Go away and, and uh, try again. But you could say, well, the paranormal explanation could be true, couldn't it? It could be. There could be a, a, a dinosaur there, plesiosaur. But paranormal or unusual explanations leave us with more things to explain. 
That's why we go for the simpler one. If you say, if this say, well, it, it is a, a, a prehistoric monster, and then you've got a lot of other things to explain now. You've not, not solved one mystery, you've got several other mysteries to uh, um, explain. Then, like, um, uh, why don't we find the bodies of these creatures? Why, why is all the evidence pointing to the fact that they, were ex they went extinct millions of years ago? 10,000 years ago, Loch Ness was a block of ice. So where have the, the dinosaurs come from? You see, you've got all these more mysteries to uh, solve. Some people have x-ray vision. Do scientists believe that? Nah, they say no. So I say at this point, well, I'm going to see. I'll, I'll, I'll um, see if I can convince you that I've got x-ray vision. So... I do a demonstration, and I'm going to speed it up. I, it's a very embellished, uh, elaborate demonstration with a story behind it, but basically it's this. Andres, bring me the box. Thank you. <laughs> don't, don't applaud, please, Lisa. <laughs> now, I, I asked Andres to... I gave Andres... Um, uh, uh, this box and an envelope with some uh, coloured cards in and asked him to select um, a, one of the coloured cards and put it in here. So it's in here, isn't it? Andres, you've put the uh, envelopes and all the others back in, haven't you? Yeah. <laughs> I told you not to. Take the... <laughs> oh. You know, you can't get the staff now, can you? <laughs> and I'm not supposed to see what he's doing either. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. So there's just one card in here now, isn't there? So um, I'm going to show you how this is done, because, you know, times... Um, you, uh, what, what you do is you, you, you study the box, of course, and... Uh, look round and the way you can tell what colour the card is is looking through the slit that you know there's a space underneath <laughs> but first of all you've got to make sure the card is visible it's dropped down so in the course of what you're doing you you do this you slightly lift the box up <laughs> <laughs> and you, uh, you broke it? <laughs> and then, I've warned you. Um, and then you say, I can see blue. Thank you. You, you laughed, didn't you? You laughed at me, didn't you? And so the children are very impressed <laughs> uh, by that. You don't, you don't tell them how it's done, first of all. You, 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 you do that. And now the children are challenged to explain how, how is, there an, is there such a thing as X-ray vision? Or is there a simpler explanation that scientists would um, endorse? And the children come out with some great things. They say, uh, it, I was lucky. Yeah? So how do we test that? How do we test that? We do it again and again. Yeah? Um, some say there are little holes in the box. How can we test that? Well, we've got to look at it carefully with a ma magnifying glass, maybe. One boy, I was really impressed with this, said, when you turned away... There was a glass cupboard, and I could have seen that. I said, that's wonderful, you know, really give him some praise for that. How can we test that? No, I'm not asking you to, plan. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah, he was, uh, thank you. He, I was really impressed with that. Um, and then eventually, eventually they might come out with the idea you can see through the slits. So how can we test that? But 
tape round, yeah? So, oh, this has got wet thing. So that's one of the demonstrations that I, I do, and, and, and the children really enjoy that. They don't like just sitting through, um, through talking. And you can use these demonstrations to just say a little bit about the, uh, about the physics, uh, introduce them for later, perhaps, what, why, how we come to see um, colour. Okay, children. I don't call them children. Um, really. uh, what's this? Oh. It's Blackpool Tower. It, Blackpool Tower, it was a copy of the Eiffel Tower. Um, and it's just a bit, a bit above half the height. Has anybody been at Blackpool Tower? Oh, well, yes, yes. Um, with the children, you know, a lot of them put their hand up because it's a children's wish in, in England to go up Blackpool Tower. Time goes faster when you are on top of Blackpool Tower. Do, you, do scientists really believe that? Yes. yes. Well, the children say, no, no, no. And then one, one bright child will, might say, well, it's because you're having a good time. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. No, I don't mean that. Time literally goes faster when you're on top of Black Culture. And uh, I then go on and explain, who's this? They all know Einstein. And uh, I say a little bit about, in simple terms, about gravity according to Einstein. Objects cause space to bend and time to slow down. Uh, so when you're on top of Blackpool, Tower gravity is a bit uh, less, so um, time will go slower. But I, as, you know, I emphasise we're talking about nanoseconds, a billionth of a second uh, now. Uh, so. This illustrates that when scientists can't explain things from how we normally understand the world, they then have to look for a really weird explanation, and, uh, and uh, that is uh, weird to our everyday way of thinking. And, but I say, you know, does it matter? It's only a few billions of a second. Does it really matter? Oh, yes. Satellite navigation systems, and I need to know that because I explain how they communicate with satellites, you know, maybe 10,000 miles from the Earth, where gravity is less. And the engineers who uh, make these devices and the satellites have to take that into account. Otherwise, after a day or a couple of days, your sat-nav, it won't work. They also have to take into account the special theory of relativity as well. People can make things move with their minds, Nah. Do scientists believe that? Nah. Okay. What, how we, could we explain what's going on here? String, maybe. Um, how can we test that? So get the idea. There are ghosts of dead people. Um, this is an old photograph. Children nowadays, they don't know. It's, photography is different, isn't it? So uh, they don't, don't know very much about double exposures and so on. Uh, some children say it could be Photoshop. Um, I don't <laughs> but uh, this uh, leads on to uh, other uh, strange sightings. There are people visiting us from outer space. Do you think scientists believe that? No, well, most of them don't. Uh, I asked the children, have you seen a ghost? They are, you know, a lot of hands go, have you seen a flying saucer? Oh yes, the hands go up. Uh, so what could this be? Uh, is it a flying saucer or it could be something more everyday? Um, the, the, um, there's a little trick here because this actually photo, this photograph was actually taken through a windscreen. So um, one of the explanations is that a pigeon flying by left something on the windscreen. <laughs> but the children like that explanation. Um, so we can't test that hypothesis now because he's probably had his car in the car wash. But. So, we, is this a flying saucer or, yeah? So we're going on to, it's a lenticular cloud. We're going on to 
what I introduced to the older children as pareidolia, seeing uh, meaningful things in um, uh, uh, random uh, uh, stimuli. The children love that. They're, they're very fond of that. The, the, one of the purposes of this talk is, is, you know, if you do any of this work or you're thinking of doing anything, or please do, um, you know, I'm just giving you some ideas now. And I can tell you the children love these um, things, Jesus in the clouds. Although they don't, know, they don't necessarily identify Jesus. Now, this is the uh, humanist's version of, the atheist version of Jesus. <laughs> Charles Darwin has put in an appearance uh, there. And uh, back to Jesus. This is a uh, football ground. Can you see uh, a man in the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is uh, the football ground at Crystal Palace, which is now Crystal Palace. Yeah. And then, of course, there's the man in, from Mars, which I, I show the uh, more recent uh, photographs of that as well. People can bend metal with their minds. Do you think scientists believe that? No, no. So I d I've, I've done some spoon bending, but I'm not very good at it. But uh, they, oh, they love that, but they do love it. And then, of course, you have to challenge them, how, what's the explanation for this? Uh, only a few children nowadays, thank goodness, have heard of um, Uri Geller in our country. Uh, it does pop up in the news. Recently, it popped up because he announced that he was using his telepathic powers to stop Mrs. May deciding to come out of the European Union. And he explained that's why all the, all, all the trouble she was having was down because of him. <laughs> now, this is all, always goes down very well, and this is dowsing with, or water divining with a twig. So, here I have... This is uh, the old method of uh, water defining. This, this is the method that Uncle Paddy from uh, Ireland showed me when I went over. We went over to see them. It's a way of finding water on land. So, and people have been doing this uh, hundreds of years. Thousands of people have done it, and are still doing it, and still believing it. And a remarkable number of people that in the UK and elsewhere believe, you know, just take it for granted that you can do this. So imagine that I'm a farmer and I'm looking for water on my land. I hold it like this in the way that the people showed me, and you go along inconspicuously <laughs> and until it turns over like this. And that indicates that there is water here. So you start digging. There's the water. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's always something. <laughs> However, I prefer to use, um, and, and a lot of people prefer to use uh, dowsing rods. And uh, here's uh, two I made earlier. Uh, you can make them with um, wire coat hangers. And what happens is, you hold them so that they're steady and horizontal. No photographs, please. <laughs> <laughs> and if you walk along, again, inconspicuously, I'm looking for water now. And oh, yes, I got a response, so I start digging here. Um, I also demonstrate to the children, give this demonstration to the children. I actually get them to come up, a couple of children to come up, but if I ask some of the volunteers, then um, you wouldn't be able to see. So imagine that the, the children are, one child is observing, or two children, and one other child is, is, um, is, um, co is helping me with this. And I ask them, first of all, we have a glass of air, empty glass, and we hold a dowsing rod above the glass, now, if it were, I shouldn't get a response here, should I? 
and you leave it long enough, just reacting to the water vapour in the air now. <laughs> and nothing happens. The next glass, I usually bring some sugar, a glass of sugar along, but there isn't any sugar, so it's a, a, a ball of paper. This is just paper. And leave it long enough. And I say, are you satisfied now? Is it going to move or not? And the drum might say, no, no, I'm satisfied now. It's not going to move. And then we have the um, water in the glass. Will it respond to the water in the glass? Wow, that was a definite response. So, what do we have here? We have a mystery here, and uh, the mystery is the dowsing rods start to move. So something, a force, must cause this to happen, and you can explain, then teach some, the children about forces. What is a force? Force is something that makes something move, causes it to stop, slow down, but change direction and so on. What force is making the, the rods to move? Dowser say it's a special or paranormal force that comes from the water. And scientists say we don't know any force like this. So is there a simpler possible explanation or do we have to accept the paranormal explanation? Now you work, the children won't be able to identify um, uh, well, some of them do, but they don't understand the, why, the principle of this. Um, but what is the, this force that causes the, or energy maybe, causes the uh, dowsing rod to move? What do you think? Your mind. Your mind. <laughs> just, just ignore him, uh, please. Uh, yeah, sorry? Idiomotor movement, yes, but that, that isn't a... That's not an actual force, is it? Is it? Is it a force? Right. I will now tell you, and the children eventually learn how to be dowsers, how you can, um, how you do it. The simplest way, you hold it loosely, there's no trickery, but the simplest way is just to rotate your wrist, your hand at the wrist. And it moves. It's, that's all it is. That's all it is. That's all these people are doing for hundreds of years. I don't go into a, a research on to dowsing, but with the adult audiences I do, and, or, or the, the, the older audiences, and I show the data and, and uh, uh, that, uh, uh, showing that no, uh, you know, nobody um, is successful when tested under controlled conditions. And my explanation for this, I don't know whether there's any mechanical engineers here or not, but I th we have a lever, a type of lever, we have the fulcrum here, we have the center of gravity somewhere here, all you have to do is raise the center of gravity above the fulcrum and it will swing. So that's what I did. So the children can now, the, the Sheffield is full of people now who know how to do this, but you can... Earn, earn lots of money doing this. If you do it, and if you do get a positive record, uh, response, and you start digging, and there's no water there, all you do is say, there's water there, but it's too deep. It's too deep. Ah. <laughs> now, you can use a dowsing with a pendulum. In this case, the pendulum is one of my wife's uh, pendants that she kindly lo loaned to us from her jewelry uh, drawer. And uh, here, you, can, you, ask the pen you get the pendulum to indicate uh, yes or no by the way it swings. Backwards and forwards means yes, side to side means no. You can also have a don't know, which could be a, a rotation and so on. And here, you see I'm, uh, you can use the, the pendulum now to um, delve into the... Uh, deeply into the unconscious mind of this young boy here and uh, there we are but uh, don't try this at home of course uh, uh, you don't know what's going to come up but uh, you, you, you just ask simple questions factual questions like um, does the pendulum um, pendulum you address as pendulum does has Tim been to Japan 
and you get a yes or no response. So you ask neutral questions. Does Tim like pork sausages? He did, actually. He did. So that's very useful to know if he comes around, you know, you can give him pork sausages. And, uh, or, you know, you can ask more probing questions like, um, is Tim happy in his work? Uh, but first of all, you can ask permission to ask that. I want, to, I want permission. Pendulum, will you give me permission to ask this question? Oh, he's come back now. Sorry, I better get this off right away. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Hello, Tim. Where have you been? <laughs> Georges Lemaitre, I tell the older children, I tell them that, about this wonderful man from Belgium, Georges Lemaitre. Georges Lemaitre was the first scientist, wonderful scientist and mathematician, and I think it was the 1920s, was it? Came up with the idea that the universe started from a tiny point and has been expanding ever since, from billions of years ago. He went to Einstein, he met Einstein in the park, I think it was the Solvay conference, I don't know, and uh, showed it to Einstein, his ideas, and Einstein wasn't impressed at all. But now we accept Georges Lemaitre's uh, the, uh, you know, the, the uh, beginnings of that theory. And I show them now a photograph of Georges Lemaitre. And what do you notice? He's religious. He's religious, yes. The children realize that he's wearing a collar. And that tells them that he's, uh, he was actually a Roman Catholic priest. So I say to the children, isn't that a bit strange? Why, what, how would he believe that, um, how does uh, Christianity say that um, the world started? But, uh, okay, so people probably said to George uh, afterwards, have you stopped believing in God then? And George Lemaitre said, certainly not, no. I still believe, and he still believed, he was still a devout Catholic to the rest, for the rest of his life. And when the Pope found out what he'd was coming out with. The Pope said, that's great, that's fine, that fits with the uh, Roman Catholic teaching. And I think that children should not have to choose between religion and science. Unlike uh, Richard Dawkins is a very, it gives the impression that you have to choose. You can, this illustrates that you can commit yourself to science, you can embrace science, but you can still keep your religion. There's children I see, they're not particularly into religion, but there are Muslim children and children, Hindu children, um, who are, you know, are regular attenders at the mosque and read the Quran. I don't know what you think, feel about that, but that's the way I feel. I'm a, I'm a humanist. I uh, teach humanism in schools in Sheffield. I'm an atheist, I identify myself as an atheist. Sometimes I tell the children the story of the Cottingley Fairies, which you may be familiar with, Elsie and Francis, a hundred years ago, very important, a hundred years ago, think about that, um, who went uh, to the local beck, as it's called, Cottingley Beck, the stream, the river, and came back with photographs of fairies. And people, lots and lots of people believe them, eminent people as well. Um, but uh, nowadays uh, people accept that these were um, cutouts. And uh, you can actually get the, um, still get on Amazon, the original Princess Mary yearbook, I think it was called. Uh, from uh, 1909 or something, uh, in which the the drawings of fairies are still there, and I can you show you can show the children the drawings of the fairies. And do you think that do you notice how like the uh, the fairies are to the drawings in the book, and they identify them? Uh, but it's a wonderful story, I think, the Cottingley fairies. Um, you, the, you can say, well, these children created it. They created the Cottingley Fairies, but they, they weren't the only people who created the Cottingley Fairies, were they? they were, it was a combined effort uh, on a national level and an international level. And the question that I ask the uh, children is, 
Why do you think people wanted, were so keen to believe in these fairies at that time? Why did they, why did they want to? I've given you a clue. I said a hundred years ago. What was happening a hundred years ago? And the Great War. And I think maybe a lot of people had suffered and they wanted to believe in something. They lost their faith, a lot of people. They went into spiritualism and so on. A lot of people uh, would want to believe in something that was pure and innocent and beautiful and kind. And of this world, but not of this world, if you, if you understand what I mean. Uh, so that's the lesson for, for children to take away and I hope remember in some way. And the other lesson is wanting something to be true does not make it more likely to be true. Well, that's a good place to end, isn't it?